are we're going to move on to talk about yay drum roll the right ventricle we're everyone's going, favorite the people's ventricle the people's ventricle yes um i am excited to start this series actually we're going to start off pretty simply yeah um we'll spend today's session just talking through assessment of right ventricular size yeah yeah That's super important really important yeah. yeah and then in subsequent videos we'll start talking about how to assess the function you know some of the basic things we're talking about including tapsy s prime and then hopefully later on we can talk about some of the more advanced features you know looking at how we can do maybe free will strain which is becoming more popular um, and even maybe talking about 3D assessment. Yeah, so I that, think we should. Yeah, yeah so awesome. we'll get some friends in for that. Definitely, yeah. we'll need some friends in for that yeah. one. But we'll we'll start at basic, and then we'll we'll progress from there. And hopefully, uh, by the end of it, you should be pretty confident with assessing the right ventricle. Yeah, the size of it for yeah. sure. And um, we'll also show. I think it'll be nice to maybe run through a toe study one time as well. Yeah, if definitely. If people would like that, of how definitely. to assess the right ventricle on toe, because um, there's some little things to be aware of with that yeah. yeah yeah cool all right so i guess the right ventricle i wonder why we love it so much because it's a bloody hard to image isn't it it is you know yeah it's it's such a Maybe unusual structure that, yeah. yeah yeah exactly i mean and the it, prognostic importance is is obviously there as well but yeah <laughs> let's not blame that um i think you know it's it's got a pretty compared to the left ventricle it's got a far more interesting and unusual kind of crescenteric and conical shape to yeah, it yeah. which um you know it's split into an inflow and outflow um, region and uh, you know, it's the most anteriorly positioned chamber in the heart and that means that it can be really really challenging to image particularly in our pop in our population yeah. and things like toe that can often make um make it, a lot of your imaging a lot easier actually doesn't necessarily make imaging of the right ventricle or particularly a tricuspid valve necessarily easier. No, well, toe is really quite challenging because mm. all of those objective measures, they're all validated with TTE, yeah. size, etc. And also aligning your, you know, aligning your Doppler, aligning things even for, you know, for M mode, for TAPSI, yeah. all of those things are, um, you know, less, less validated um, yeah. with toe as well. So yeah. definitely TTE is the, um, you know, obviously the thing that we, we use most, but we will have a low threshold, you know, in patients with ARDS that are ventilated to, to tow them. Yeah. And there's a lot of data, obviously, from um, the experts in this area and in France with Antoine Viabaron yeah. and things like that, that use a lot of transesophageal echo for, yeah. for RV ass assessment and pulmonary hemodynamic assessment. Exactly. And in the important. Uh, it's important in the ICU, particularly to remember that the RV and the PA are coupled units. And this is a area that you have a particular interest in. Yeah, I it's do. Uh, I think, yeah, I part mean, of a big project that you might be doing. Yes, it's um, and inextricably linked. Aren't they, they are. They are. Actually, to understand the RV performance more, if you're coupling it with the yeah. what's happening in yeah. pulmonary circulation. Yeah, but I guess just for today, let's keep it simple. Let's keep the RV in isolation, um, and the transthoracic views that we'll commonly be using to assess this. So. In your parasternal long axis view, we don't really we don't have any images to show this, but these are all conventional images that that people should be doing. So, in your parasternal long axis view, you often have your right ventricular outflow tract at the top. Um, yeah, you can measure it in that view. That isn't something I would I classically do. I have got a picture. I have got oh, a, have the, um, an image of that if you'd oh, like. Very if good. We, whilst yeah. we're here, I mean, we we might as well show it. this one here. Yeah, yeah. So so this is a this is a parasternal long axis view, and you can see that right ventricle at the top of the screen. So you know, you've got your RV outflow tract here, your um, your aortic valve and ascending aorta here, and your left atrium here. And now people do a visual assessment of this, and they look at the rule of thirds. And this is often the, your home when you're starting to do it to do a scan. And uh, just an eyeball of that RV outflow tract can indicate whether it might be dilated. And just catching this early can really guide. Um, you know, you're going to do a systematic assessment, but you can, you might need to do a slightly more detailed assessment of that right ventricle if you've noticed that already. Yeah, this is often the first view. I must say, I love the parasternal long axis because yeah. it's just, it gives you so much information. But you like, loved all of the views <laughs> <laughs> equally. <laughs> Let's not expose my pure <laughs> view. Um, 
but you know, yes. So eyeballing that, it looks the the rule of the. Sorry, Mark. If we just go back to that eyeballing that, it does look the rule of thirds. It does look dilated. But I yeah. must say, you see how the septum's not completely horizontal. It's yeah. down a bit. Probably yeah. you would want to try and move up a rib space hey, and repeat that. Yeah. Repeat that measurement because that's very very dilated it's for big. that proximal RVOT. Yeah. So I think you know upper end of normal for the proximal RVOT is thirty five millimeters, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So three point five. Yeah. This is four point six, which matches our eyeball. But I would like to to see that in more views. For sure, yeah. for sure. And then from your parasternal long axis view, um, you can you can both tilt the tail of the probe up to get to the RV inflow view and the tail of the probe down to get the RV outflow view. And these are really the nicest. I mean, the RV inflow view is definitely the nicest image image to look at the tricuspid valve on TTE, isn't it? You can get really beautiful images of the tricuspid valve. Yeah, it's my favorite. Yeah. And you often get your You just said another one was oh, your favorite. Yeah, just yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, you do get that like, nice alignment for Doppler as well. You do, Continuous you do. Wave um, and then from your parasternal long axis view, you often transition to your to your parasternal short axis view. Now, I always start at the basal um, short axis view when I when I rotate round. I know that different people vary where they go, but this um, th this basal short axis view is probably one of my favourite views where you get your aortic valve in the middle in cross section, and then you get your left atrium underneath, the interatrial septum, the um, right atrium tricuspid, RV outflow tract, pulmonary valve, and main pulmonary artery oh, in the bifurcation. I want that one as well. <laughs> so you love them all equally. Um, but th this really is a, a really nice view, and this is another place where you can measure the size of your RV outflow tract, yeah. um, both your proximal and your distal. Yeah. Chris, we forgot to mention the timing of when we should be doing these measurements. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So end diastole. So you can see here we're in that short axis. Um, just move, just tilt it up past the aortic valve, actually, which yeah. you often need to do. And yeah. we're going to measure now the, again, the, um, you know, the proximal RVOT. And again, it's dilated here, but we're going from, we're doing 2D linear measurements, inner edge to inner edge and yeah. diastole. Yeah. And the, the proximal RV OT diameter in this view rather than the plaques view, I think 30, 30 millimeters, isn't it, is the upper end of normal for this one? Yeah, I think it's 35 millimeters oh, it 35? now um, with the ASC yeah. guidance, 35 millimeters. Yeah. Um, but the distal one can be really difficult to, to get and, and it's hard to get that, um, that view of your pulmonary valve and your and your main pulmonary artery and yeah you do need to kind of be looking a little bit um, higher than the aortic valve for the proximal RVOT and sometimes you need to kind of tilt the tail of the probe okay. towards you towards slightly you, yeah. or um, or towards the patient's right just to look slightly further yeah. over to that to that left hand side yeah. um, so uh, on this view we wouldn't be measuring that because it's um, it's just Oh, but we're, we're well, losing half of it. Yeah, there you're anyway. lo losing half of it, which is that you know that tilt that you just mentioned. So mm. bringing the tail more medially, yeah. um, just bringing that that whole um, RVOT pulmonary valve, um, pulmonary artery, etc., into a view of its own, really. And sometimes you can use the t you know the tilt functions really helpful yeah. for yeah. imaging the RV. Um, you know, narrowing that sector width, bring, bringing the tilt uh, across to the right, and you see sonographers do that all the time. And often they'll put on you know different B color modes as well, mm -hmm. um, just to yeah. help try and make that endocard you know yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that border um, pop a little yeah, more so you yeah can for sure and uh, a bit yeah the, so the upper limit for the for the distal RVOT is now pictures being around 27 millimeters yeah said now so for the RVOT proximal it's 35, 35. and then for the RVOT distal 27 27 okay 27 yeah so this patient's got dilated yeah RVOT and a couple yeah. of views there haven't they yeah and there are certain conditions where specifically dilatation of the of the outflow tracks is really important and it's a key yes. thing that that um that can be the only feature for them yeah, and maybe you know, with some trabeculations with some tra maybe. trabeculations you know um arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy i'm pleased you said that and not oh, <laughs> yeah uh this is uh, you know this is a key thing that that you get rvot dilatation and that could be the only feature and it's it's a really difficult diagnosis to diagnose on um, on echo alone, and often these people need a cardiac MRI. But um, specific dilatation of that in someone who's had arrhythmias could be really important. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Important to know the values. This one uh, just shows that again the difficulty, um, but you can see how the they have tilted across more, so we're getting more of the the PA in there. Mm. Um, haven't quite. But imagine if you just put that tilt function on now, yeah. you could probably get that whole um, PA. And they actually had color on this, which you can remove on, you know, on echo packs, yeah. which is quite nice. You can That's take the color off, handy. and then it's a little bit of eye of faith, isn't it, <laughs> to try and pick out that border. But um, I think just to re-emphasize the tilt function, maybe playing around with the B color map.
um, maybe turning the dynamic range down it as well just to get rid of that contrast you know yeah. make it more sort of black yeah. and white yeah, yeah. Um, can help with your measurements yeah. there as well your apical four chamber view is where classically we talk about comparing the size of the left ventricle yeah. and your right ventricle should be about two thirds the size of the left ventricle and uh, visually if they're the same size it's probably dilated and if it's bigger than the left ventricle then that's probably severely dilated so that's, that's the simplest way to do it yeah. simplest way to eyeball it but yes the caveat is that the RV is an anterior structure if you're starting to foreshorten your left ventricle then you're going to be imaging more anteriorly and you'll get because the RV wraps around that left ventricle then it's going to start to look bigger yeah with the world cup being on i suppose it's a nice you know to talk about not not yeah. having it you don't want it to look like a football no true soccer ball a soccer football ball. Football. Football, football yeah football. <laughs> both english it's a football <laughs> um you want it to look like that rugby ball shape really yeah. important before you start making any visual assessment make sure you're not foreshortened yeah and as you said if that rv is apex forming it's often easy because mm -hmm. it's severely dilated yeah and if it's the same size in my mind that's moderately dilated yeah. Yeah. And if it's a bit more than two thirds, then mildly dilated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there are some linear measurements and area measurements that we can do of that. Yeah. So we're going to be looking at the basal diameter. And we're, just to before we do that, we really should be doing an RV focused view, yeah, where we're going to be important. yeah, we're, we're yeah. going to be sliding further laterally and just tilting the tail of the pro laterally to get a bit more of an RV view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would definitely recommend spending, if you can, some time with, you know, experienced sonographers or people yeah. that are good at scanning just to really perfect that RV mm. focus view. Because otherwise there's just, you know, there's no point in making these objective measures if we're not doing it in the RV focus view. And what we have here, it's, um, you know, it's not a perfect RV focus, but you can see that the, you know, the sonographers has moved laterally. They've made the RV more uh, the focus, <laughs> the <laughs> RV focus view. And we're trying to make that RV, you know, as big as as big as possible essentially yeah. but not foreshortening and really a really important thing is to make sure that you can't see your aortic valve in this view yeah um because if you're seeing the aortic valve then you're, you're that's not an rv focus so um and then you're going to measure again end diastole and you're measuring just above the at the base which is just above the tricuspid annulus um inner edge to inner edge then i've measured at the midpoint um which is the mid part of the ventricle inner edge to inner edge and then we measure the length of the right ventricle from the apex um and just uh, uh, intersecting at the mid point of that basal um, measurement there and some of the normal values chris for for this what do you have in in mind uh so the i mean the asc uh, values at the moment are well they seem to change all the time are um more than 41 millimeters for the basal yeah. um diameter uh over 35 millimeters for the mid diameter yeah. and over 83 millimeters for the for the length yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so this would be dilated at the base, wouldn't it? Yeah. But the mid, not so much. And the length is OK. Yeah. Um, so you'd want to repeat those measurements. And of course, with different pathological states, you get different degrees of remodeling. Yes. You know, if you've got volume overloaded states with TR, you tend to get more of that circular spherical remodeling. Mm -hmm. And then with pressure, more of that sort of rectangular remodeling. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it's important to report all of them. And, and obviously the, the trend um, is, is key as well. And it's, and it's um, size relative to the LV you know when you're looking at definitions like acute corporal manala and things like that yeah important to yeah. do it in reference and to then that. with this view with the same view you can also do your um your uh, rv end diastolic area yeah. which is probably slightly trickier to do but it uh, you know i i think is a really important thing to be measuring because we know that fractional area changes is a pretty good measure of RV function, you know, probably superior to TAPSI. So it's one that I've started doing a lot more. And um, th I guess the, the key thing for this is to make sure that you're including your trabeculations in your measurement. So yeah. the, the RV is heavily trabeculated and often you can see the trabeculations, um, but you need to be including them in your measurement. So we've got an example here as yeah. well. Particularly in the chronic pulmonary hypertension groups yeah. where you have lots of trabeculations. Loads, yeah. yeah. Or the arrhythmogenic um, <laughs> RV cardiomyopathies as well. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, we're going to be scrolling it forwards yeah. and backwards yeah. and finding the largest point in end diastole. Yeah. And then getting your um, RV end diastolic area and then tracing all the way around. For, uh, all the way around. And, and it's really this point at the top that you see people missing out but you you really do need to include that apex in in your measurement as well yeah and coming back down to the tricuspid annulus as well you know yes that's, yeah, that's yeah, important. yeah yeah and here you've scrolled forwards and also measured end and systolic area now there are normal measures for end systolic area area too um 
I don't have those off the top of my head. But you know, doing these both of these together is something that will then give you your fractional error change, which is a measure of function that we'll come on to. Yeah, we'll come on to time. next time. It does correlate uh, pretty well with RV ejection fraction yeah. by MRI. So, yeah. So um, one of it's quite. Well, I wouldn't, you know, I don't think this is easy to do in our patient group. For You can see why with this yeah. example, yeah, yeah, yeah. because yeah. it's really eye of faith sometimes, you know, and I suspect, again, as I say, if we repeat that, we'll get different values for that RV yeah. area. Um, but it's it's the best we have. And, you know, again, the trend trend is important and clinical context and looking at everything else. So did we mention the normal values for RV and diastolic area, did you say? Uh, no, I didn't. So RV and diastolic area, um, we, for, it's different whether you're male or female. Mm. So men, um, upper limit is 24 centimetres squared and um, for women it's 20 centimetres squared. But it's often more important, particularly for most measurements that we do, to index those to the body surface area. Yeah. Um, so okay. the the indexed upper limit for men is 12.6 centimetres per metre squared mm -hmm. and the upper limit for women is 11.5. Yeah, and I think it will become more of our um, common dialogue that we're actually talking about RV indexed areas. Yeah. Um, and it's different across eth ethnic groups as well, isn't it? Like it is, so yeah, many yeah, variables. Yeah. You know, little tiny woman is going to obviously be different to a man, yet we always talk about... Um, you know, the basal diameter yes, being, being more than 41. And it's like, no, but that RV is huge, yep. you know, for this patient, but it's yep. like measuring 39 millimeters or something. Yep. But it's like twice the size of the RV. And yes, so yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. it's context as well. So I think it's worth mentioning that this is uh, an area measurement, not a not a volume measurement. So for the left ventricle, we're doing Simpson's biplane that we talked about. If we really want to be doing 2D echo um, volumes, but that uses a lot of assumptions about this about the shape of the left ventricle because it's a lot more regular as a structure. Whereas the right ventricle, we're slicing this at a point, and it's a very atypical structure. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's got three parts. It's got three parts to it, yeah. and you this is an area because it's not going to make those assumptions. Absolutely, that's why it's yeah. just it's really really difficult to get RV yeah. volume measures. Yeah, with without using three D or, or cardiac MRI. Cardiac MRI. Yeah. I suppose we do get volumes with conductance catheters, with yep. fast response PA catheters yes, as well. Yes, we do. But we it's do. these sort of hybrid techniques that we need to, I think, investigate more as well in our patient group. Yeah, watch this space. Yeah. Um, so I guess the last measurement we should talk about is um, slightly different to kind of the size, but it's more um, more indicative of kind of a chronic remodeling of the right ventricle. So we're going to talk about the RV free wall thickness. Yeah, it's interesting you say chronic because there is some literature out there to suggest that it can happen in about forty eight hours or yeah, so, really early, really early. Yeah, particularly it's, on the ventilator, it can happen apparently within yeah. about forty eight hours. Yeah, yeah, which is interesting. It's, it's all part of that sort of um, you know uh, homeometric. Um, adaptation is yeah. to increase pressures yeah. to maintain maintain coupling. I would definitely recommend reading this uh, lovely article, Assessment of the Right Ventricle by Echocardiography, Primer for Cardiac Sonographers, but I think it's just generally for everyone, of yeah. course. Um, and well, we are cardiac sonographers as well, because we scan the heart. True. So technically, True. It's we, for we, we count. It's all, it's an, it's it's all, all inclusive. Income. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the way and yes, it, I mean, it's got some lovely tips in there and really, you know, it focuses on that, that precision of measurement. And I think, you know, that's, that's very important. Um, so the way that we would measure RV free wall thickness is we do a zoom, so subcostal view. And that's because you've got that the best, that perpendicular alignment with the RV free wall. You've got the best axial resolution. You're less yeah. like, likely to make errors. Um, zooming in again to improve your resolution and measuring leading edge to leading edge of that RV free wall. Um, you can imagine this being tricky though, right? Because you've got the liver there just next to it, it yep. can sometimes be confused. You've yep. got the liver capsule, you've got the pericardial fat yep. sometimes, which can appear brighter than it does here. And you've got trebeculation And trebeculation. Well. So it's often included in the measurement, which they shouldn't be and can falsely, it's such a small measurement that it can falsely um, suggest that it's yeah, elevated. Really important um, not to include those things. And it, sometimes you get it as, you know, lovely like this, but this is a real life example and it's definitely not as, as lovely as that yeah. is it and it shows you just the difficulties in in actually assessing it i mean eyeballing it doesn't look like it's too hypertrophy does it um we should mention the normal value is more than five millimeters less than five millimeters sorry <laughs> <laughs> thank you chris i'm glad i've got you here we're teaching everything everyone the wrong thing <laughs> um so if it's yeah of course less than five millimeters yeah. um would be normal so yeah. What do you what do you think of this critique this measurement? Well, I think that's probably um, 
not a bad measurement. Visually, it doesn't look particularly hypertrophied. And we do have a pretty good, um, pretty good uh, uh, image of the of the RV free wall there. So I, th I think you could probably rely on this measure. I know some people who use M mode to actually definitely delineate those those layers, yeah. which is quite interesting. Uh, not something that I tend to do, but something that I've been recommended to do in the past. Clearly, I didn't didn't take that advice, but it, it definitely does work. And I think it's just important to make sure you don't you're not too close to the to the tricuspid valve apparatus and you're not too um too far towards the yeah, apex because yeah. your trabeculation is going to become more pronounced and it's going to be quite difficult to to differentiate what is free wall and, and what's trabeculation yeah. so just picking a point here um you know what did where did that article suggest it's suggest doing it at the level of the cordage yeah, yeah 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 which is probably reasonable yeah, yeah. um and i think m mode is very very reasonable yeah. i know that the linear sort of 2d linear measurements are, are mm -hmm. recommended now but you you don't have that problem with translate with um with being perpendicular and oblique slicing yeah. like you do you know in the plaques view so you, you take that out of the equation and you're going to get really good um temporal resolution yeah i suppose you're not really that bothered about temporal resolution here but yeah but it does help you delineate that um you know the different layers it does it does i well. think and um you know i guess just before you do a mode it's all about trying to optimize your 2d image first before you move on to that and that'll make it much easier yeah. and so this is potentially a mark of chronicity um although we have suggested that you, know, you can get it very early you know even just 48 hours on a ventilator that that you can start to get remodeling but you tend to not get very dramatic remodeling you know you, you wouldn't get a, a, a um, free wall thickness of a centimeter yeah. if you've just been on the ventilator for mm -hmm. a few days yeah. so you can get a, a, a marginal transient increase uh, but if it's very chunky very thick then it probably indicates some kind of Definitely. chronic pulmonary hypertension yeah. yeah for sure yeah. Yeah. All right, so that is RV size um, and RV free wall thickness. <laughs> so um, next time we will talk a little bit more about function. So that's probably going to be two or three, two or three, yeah, two or three um, episodes okay. on RV function. You know, something we want to do right, something that is very relevant in our population. Yeah, so and some um, cases as well. Yeah, and some cases. Yeah. So uh, we hope you enjoyed and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.